I don't know, um, obviously, I don't know where you are all at in your life, uh, in your life story. My guess is some of you are in a really good spot. You're celebrating what God is doing. There's some answered prayers and some breakthroughs uh, that just happened. And we praise God with you. But I also know in a group uh, this size, there's probably some of us uh, who are walking through uh, some things that are, that are difficult. And we some some of the things we may have been praying for for quite a while, and it's a, it's been a struggle. Um, you maybe have bought a lie that the enemy is telling about telling to you about you or about your situation. Um, things might look uh, maybe somewhat hopeless unless God does something. It's kind of been my wife and my journey um, over the last uh, four months or so of, of just walking through some, some times where it was just like, God, are you even hearing our prayer? And tonight, um, if that is you, my, my prayer, we want, we're going to go into a time um, of worship. And my prayer is that somehow through the song, through what is being shared, um, maybe even between songs, that this could be um, just a bit of a, like a refuge. Like it'd actually be a place you could, we're, we're here, we're together, um, the peace of God could be with us, and that we could experience um, his presence in a way that would bring hope. Numerous times in the Old Testament, uh, the, the uh, the children of Israel would send their would send their singers before the army into battle, and I think there's there's something there's something about worship that does something to the enemy that is so powerful. It is a supernatural thing, and so as we as we sing um, tonight, sing songs. If you know the songs, please. Follow along. Um, if you're someone that just it works better for you to stand and worship, on the back wall. So we want tonight we're, we're starting with just the worship uh, to the Lord, and we ask you to join in if you care to. And then even as we share the program, um, that it would that it would be clear that what we're doing is not trying to lift up any organization, new horizons for sure. Or any individuals, um, because it all belongs. Honor and glory all belong um, to the Lord. Father, tonight we just thank you for this incredible opportunity to be together like this. Lord, the the, the food and the fellowship we've enjoyed, um, and God, tonight uh, we just want our hearts to be turned towards you. Um, as was prayed earlier, just that there would be uh, that you would reign on our souls, or the places that are dry or barren. Uh, that, that tonight would be a time of encouragement. In a way that only you can. Yeah. Pray that you would be pleased and you would be happy with our worship here tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
pasties tonight. But even more importantly than that, is like Arlen said, that we worship and we taste and see the goodness of the Lord tonight. Psalms 34 is a favorite of mine. When I think about David penning these words so many years ago as the Holy Spirit gave them to him, come and magnify the Lord with me. If you don't know this song, you can learn it by the second verse. We invite you to sing along. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he
Oh, Father God, you're so good. So tonight, we exalt you. We lift you up. We invite your presence as we lay our cares down and worship and adore you. You're an amazing God, worthy of all praise. Your goodness is amazing to us.
this next song that we're singing, well, let me go back. The last song we sang talks about God reigning on the throne. I feel like sometimes we as believers have this picture of God as way out there or way up in heaven. Um, but our God stepped into the brokenness of this world. He took nail scars on his hand for each person that will um, put their faith in him. This next song talks about the character of God. In prison, there's a lot of brokenness, a lot of darkness, a lot of fear. Um, but we also realize that even in our own communities, our own churches, even in this place, there may be brokenness, there may be shattered dreams. We just ask you to turn your eyes on Jesus as we sing this song and remember that his character is to bring healing, hope, joy. In those dark times of life, we can keep our eyes on him and he will bring us through.
The Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Think about that. I know that these were the words of prophecy about Jesus Christ. But when you think about the calling that you have been given, could it be, is it true, that the Lord has anointed you and I to preach the tidings to the poor, proclaim, I love that one in there, that is in the song, to restore the shame that sin has stolen. painful times, these losses in our lives and we realize that God was there, what God what Satan meant for evil, God turns into good, the beauty for the ashes it's amazing his goodness as that happens so I'd like to share a little story about how God does that sometimes one of the more painful times in my life was the time of my dad's suicide death and um, yeah, the journey, the despair, the hopelessness, the shame. This is supposed to happen in a in a church setting, and all of those things that work through your mind and that and that come out from that. And then you see the healing. You you sense the healing. You sense what God is doing. And so, in our sing along times, Ruth and I sometimes will share out of those um, journeys that we've been through. And in county jail here several months back, it's been years so though actually now, when, we, when I shared a little bit about work, walking through that and, and looking back and seeing God sustaining and blessing, there was a young man, there was a man there that heard the story and uh, he asked if he could talk to uh, Chaplain Caleb and myself and so we went off and we started talking and he shared his story. He said, um, I knew that you would understand but as he shared his heartbreaking story, <laughs> yeah, at the age of 12, he uh, started drinking with his dad. They were awful. There was a lot of alcoholism there in the family, and already 12, he was drinking. And through his teen years, he made many unwise choices and had a tough journey. Later on in, in life, his dad took his life. His dad, he found his dad in a motel room with his slip with his waist and his wrist, I'm sorry, slipped. And then a few years later after that, his mother also, not able to deal with the pain, took her life. And then sometime later, his older sister took a revolver and ended her life as well. And as if that wasn't enough, a few years later, his, old, his younger sister overdosed on drugs. As we journey through that and as we process the pain, one of the things This is just who I was. This is just who I thought I was always going to be. And you just live with this. You don't talk about it. You just know this is your journey. But he saw the hope in Christ Jesus that day. <laughs> and he became a different man. He found his life in Christ. And as we wept together, as we prayed together, there was healing there in such a powerful way that Frank, when he arose from the anointing, breaking off that curse of death, that those lies that surrounded his life there was a new joy in him there was a new peace i remember later when we go in to sing and ruth would say boy did you see frank smile today <laughs> the lord does that doesn't he isn't he amazing how he does that he does that we are his hands and feet as we speak jesus the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, 
to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. Um, isn't it amazing that the hardest things that we go through in life can actually be the things that God uses to reach out and, and, and bless other people. We can walk alongside others because of um, because of the work, the healing that God has done. Thank you for sharing that part of your story, of your story, Mark. And just to know that I really believe that all of us, um, God has called all of us to walk in Jesus' footsteps. Those scriptures that were read, read earlier were prophetic of Jesus, um, but they're also, they're also scriptures that we can um, apply to our lives today. Because I believe that God is calling us, every one of us who are believers, to preach good tidings, um, to bind with the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to the prisoners. And as uh, Chris was sharing too, you know, it's, it's easy for us maybe at times when we look out there and we see those people out there and we're like, you know, that's where the hurting, those are where the, that, those are where the prisoners are. But the truth of the matter is that, uh, is that there are times, there are times when I am the prisoner. There are times when I am the one that needs to hear the good tidings. I'm the one that is brokenhearted. I'm the one that is captive. And I need my brothers and sisters um, to rally around me. And it doesn't matter where we get our, our paycheck from. I get my paycheck from New Horizons. It's a mission, right? Um, but then some of you get your checks, or probably most of you get your checks from a for-profit business, which is amazing that you get, you have a pulpit to preach from that I don't have. But every one of us is called um, to take Jesus to the world, take Jesus to the broken places around us. Thousands of people um, all around us are in need of a touch. From Jesus, hope, healing, um, and we are we are um, of God that we can take that um, to many people. For us at um, at New Horizons, that is um, to those who are incarcerated. Um, New Horizons exists to break the cycle of incarceration. And I don't know how much you know about the cycle of incarceration. Um, I knew very little of it before I really got involved in prison ministry. Meant most times the cycle of incarceration begins with addiction. Um, and those addictions can come, come about because of being in the wrong, uh, having the wrong friends. Um, we did a survey just this past year with many of the prisoners and they said the reason they got involved in addictions was because of the neighborhood that they were in. After school, they would come home from school, didn't have anything else to do, so they'd run down to the basketball court, wherever they would go, and there's where the bad influences were, and that's where the addiction started. So um, they, uh, this cycle of, in, of incarceration many times begins with addictions um, because the habit often gets more expensive, the lives start falling apart, uh, then it moves to, um, to crime, to, to pay for their addictions and to make ends meet. Um, crime leads to prison, and for 98% of people that go to prison, um, they will get out someday. And so they get out, and now that they have a, um, a felony on their record, they're faced with many more uh, challenges uh, in life, and so they go back to their addiction. Addiction leads to crime, crime leads to prison, prison leads to uh, reentry, and that cycle goes on and on. In Colorado, um, there's approximately 31,000 people that are incarcerated. Um, read just recently that there's over 120,000 people in Colorado that are, are in trouble with the law in some ways. So you got 31,000 in prison, the rest of them are in jails or halfway houses, um, on parole or probation, in youth detention um, facilities. That's a lot of people. And every single one of them matters. And there are a population of people that are, um, for the most part in society today, are just um, ignored or, or just pay no attention to them. It's kind of like you go by, you go by the, the prisons and you're just like, well, the bad people are in there. Thank God. Hope they keep them there. And we don't think about them. They're, they have emotions just like us. They have challenges just like us. They want to be loved just like us. They want to have purpose in their life just like us. They want to be forgiven 
just like that. Fremont County, uh, where we live, uh, there are nine correctional facilities in a county jail, and we're just kind of right in the middle of all of that. And just what a what an incredible opportunity um, to be able to take the, the love of Jesus again. Like I say, maybe the most concentrated group of broken people of that you could go anywhere in America uh, is to go in there and be able to take the love of Jesus to them. I talked a little bit about the cycle earlier in Colorado, nearly 50% of, of everyone within three years. And for us, we might not be very compassionate at trying to just say, well, well, just stop doing your illegal activity. Just, just quit. Um, it's easy for us to say that. But when they're released from prison, uh, there's a number of challenges that they face. One of them is the biggest one is just finding a job. Who's going to hire them now that they have a felony? On their record, and if they're not if they're not making money, then housing becomes an issue. And for many of them, um, they get paroled back into the exact in, into the same county, same city uh, that they were arrested from. And there is where their friends are, and they go right back. So the, if there's not any inter intervention, that cycle will continue on and on. We have a, a short video here of one of our chaplains uh, just sharing some of the things that he has he has an experience and and some of the things that break his heart as he serves. As I think about the cycle of incarceration, there are several things that come to my mind. The first one is that in the jail, I've had the opportunity to see men and some women come in several times over the process of the year. And so I see the cycle happening in one person's life where they uh, find themselves coming back over and over. The other way that I've seen it happen is generationally as well. Something happened deep inside of me one day when I walked up to a cell and realized that a father and a son were sharing the same cell in the county jail. Sometimes our choices come out of a place in our heart that we're not sure what to do with. And that's what I find a lot in, in the county jail as I work with men is that they need to find healing in their soul so that they can move forward in their lives. And to be able to be a place for them in this part of their life, to come to process what has gone on in their life, what's in their heart, and then to, to invite the Lord to come into that and do his work of healing is such an honor. When a person gets born again, there are several things that I notice. The first one is openness and humility. And it's such an honor and a pleasure to see that when they recognize their need for Christ, it opens their heart to find help and healing that they never had before, that previously they thought they could find on their own. The other thing that happens is peace and rest. I've heard a variety of testimonies of men that say, I've never slept this well since I've given my life to the Lord and been baptized. children who have a parent in prison. 
And I remember um, as, a, as a young young person driving or riding down the road and seeing people in the ditch picking up trash and, and um, having striped jumpsuits on, and I would wonder, well, I wonder what they did. You know, kind of seeing them as they're the bad people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a good person and I, I wonder what they did. Never one time did I think about it that these, these people in the ditch or that were in the van with the bars over the windows or behind the, the fences with the razor wire, but they were somebody's mom and dad. They were somebody's brother or sister or some son or daughter. I didn't see them in the context of a family. And when we start to think about how uh, disruptive this is in a, in a child's life, already living in a, in a uh, destructive, um, oftentimes addiction, um, drugs environment, and then dad goes off and mom goes off to prison. And uh, many of these children are left with um, trying to figure life out on their own. It's not just a Colorado problem. In the United States, one in 14 children has or has had a parent who is in prison. I'm gonna show a video uh, next. It's actually one of the one of the moms that went through our program. Um, her children were um, profoundly affected by incarceration, but her life was also affected by incarceration. Listen to Yvette's story. My life growing up was, it was difficult. I didn't grow up with my mother or my father. My mother went to prison when I was about three months. We were in Kansas City when my mother got arrested. My dad asked my grandmother, my mom's mom, to take us in and raise us. And she did. Life was, it was good. It was just like no one in my family we never talked about our issues. It was more like just spoke of the rug. So going into adulthood after high school was, it was different. It was weird. Like I get to make my own decisions and make my own rules. So I had met a guy. We got into a relationship and I wound up pregnant at the age of 19. Having my own baby, it was, it was difficult. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and then I wound up pregnant again. And <laughs> two years later with another baby. I had been married the first time for seven years. And my second marriage is what sent me on the path towards prison. I was in an abusive relationship and to help cope with the abuse, I drank and I started drinking and driving. Even though there was like a protection order between us, I was still being around him. Then when things didn't go his way in our marriage, he would use the protection order as a, basically like a leash. Like if you don't do what I say, then I can put you in jail. And so I started going to jail a lot for violating the protection order. I felt hurt, sad, like I didn't understand, like, why my husband didn't cheat on me. I didn't understand why I was being abused. I tried to be like the perfect wife and it was just like everything that I was, I was doing just wasn't good enough and I didn't understand why. I was actually mad at that at that time because I was like, why would you put me through something like this? Like you're supposed to be my protector but I'm not feeling really protected. I went to prison the first time at 34. I did nine months the first time in La Vista, and then I got out, I went to the halfway house, and I did good for like the first two months, and then I got back in contact with my husband once again, and it seemed like I was just waiting for that evil person to come back out. And he showed me that person to deal with that. Once again, I started drinking. I stopped following the rules in the halfway house. I, I stopped trying. Literally, I gave up on myself and I just gave up on trying to get out of the penal system. And I wound up back in prison again. I did not know that I was pregnant when I went to prison. <laughs> to find out that I was pregnant, I was in shock. I was like, this cannot be happening to me. My emotions were everywhere because I was I was confused, I was shocked, I was scared, I was just so many things at the same time. So my kids 
because I have I had six kids before this baby. I was okay because I was just one kid. I was like, okay, well, I got one more. Like, that's, that's okay, I can deal with that. And then I went to the doctor and they did an ultrasound on me. And then they was like, I think there's twins in there. I was like, no, 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 no. Not one wife, but two wives. And I'm stuck in prison. Like, I'm not gonna have babies in a prison. Like, I, that was never a way that I pictured my life to go at all. <laughs> So how I met the doulas was I was already pregnant, and so I had an appointment in the clinic, and I didn't know what it was for because it didn't say what it was for. And so that's when I very first met Dorcas and Louise. When I started the class, like they were just explaining about how pregnancies go. Program, the more that I went. I was like, this just sounds like, like something that I want to do. Like, it's a chance for me to get my life together. It's a chance for me to start all over and be a good mom. I didn't know how to be a good mom because I didn't have anybody to show me what it was to be a good parent and how to raise children. And so I took this opportunity to get out of the situation that I was in in Denver because in Denver, I know how to go back to old ways, old habits, old areas that I shouldn't be hanging around, old people that I shouldn't be talking to or being around. It was like God opened my eyes, it's like he was speaking to me. And he was telling me like, I'm giving you an opportunity to get your life back in order. And he brought Dorothy and Louise into my life. And it was such a blessing to have them in my life. Like, they care. Like, they just want you to be able to follow Christ and do, follow God. And it's just, it's just been such a blessing to be around them and the community and just everybody. It's just like a big blessing. But mainly decided to place my name with New Horizons because I didn't want them to have to go through what my other kids were going through. When they said that they'll, they have someone that will take the baby, care for them how I would care for them, I'm still making decisions and I'll still get to see my baby every week. I met Alvin and Wanda, we talked and I felt comfortable with leaving my kids there with them. How it impacted my relationship with seeing my kids while I was still in prison, it, even though I couldn't be with them every day, the bond that we shared when I was with them was really strong. It was just keeping that door open so they know who I was. Getting out of prison was, it was overwhelming. <laughs> no one ever gets out of prison and they have their own place. Like that's just, that's unheard of. And to get out of prison and to have my own space it felt really good, but it felt overwhelming at the same time. It's just such my kids, like that was just, it was just the best feeling ever. Our bond with both of my kids are just so strong. Like, they know who I am. They feel me and I feel them. Having a community here has impacted me because I feel loved. I feel, like, I know they care. They don't see me as, an next time, they see me as a person. I'm not focused on men and alcohol. <laughs> I'm focused on my kids. I'm focused on trying to be a better person. I'm tired of going to prison. I'm tired of being away from my kids. I'm tired of watching the world go on without me in it. Like, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of something bigger. My relationship with God has been so great. <laughs> He's teaching me how to forgive. If you give yourself to him, he will show you that he has you. But you have to give yourself, you have to believe, you have to want to be a part of God. One of the things that uh, surprised Ryan and I when we moved to Colorado was um, the relationships that we had with mom. Uh, we went to Colorado to do child care, and then we, and as we would take the, the babies in to see their mothers, we'd sit across the table from them, and we would begin to hear 
historians. They're broken. So much brokenness. Um, stories that, uh, that I, I couldn't I couldn't have made up the way they were. Uh, uh, just the, the um, how they had been violated. And we sit across the table so blessed and so naive and um, just to know how to minister uh, to them. But we know Uh, but we know that God is pursuing them. God is pursuing all of us in the stories that we have. And, we, and the next song that we would like to sing and, um, is God is in the story. Again, we are our purpose, or the reason we exist is to break the cycle of incarceration 
and we do that in three ways um, in children's ministries and we'll go through these each of these three ways and as i go through i'll share some of the uh, some of our staff needs and, and, and an update of where things are at in the, each of these um, divisions uh, but we care for children um, of mothers who are incarcerated also care for children in risk situations both of these would be as like as, as foster families uh, we are a child placement agency and so we can license uh, train and license uh, foster homes and um, so these are these are children that are placed and we also are doing um, children's events and clubs for for children who have or have had a parent um, who is incarcerated and we're just looking for how can we step into their lives through uh, through uh, kids clubs and this summer for the first time we're going to be doing, doing a summer camp uh, for these children just to uh, to speak into their lives and and bring healing for them. Some of our staff needs always looking for foster families. And I would just say, if there's someone here tonight and you're thinking, man, I would love to foster children, but I don't know if I should or not, um, seriously pray about it. Um, I just feel like as a church, we should be here waiting uh, to, for, for children who, who need a home. Uh, we live in a country where the, where children are taken out of some of the worst homes, and they're, they can be placed in some of the best, but I believe the church needs to be here waiting uh, for that. And I would just put a plug in if you're like, well, nobody in my community does. I know a community uh, that does a lot of fostering and a lot of adoption. We would welcome you to come um, and do it there. Always looking for more foster families. Our local, our county, our local county is begging us for more homes. They love what they see happening in. Are, are asking for foster families that would um, care for older children um, as well. Uh, most of our homes prefer seven to, um, seven or eight years old and below, um, but there are other children that need that need that um, care as well. Um, children's ministry support staff, this would be more on, in the lines of singles. Uh, if you would like to come and be a part of, of helping with the kids clubs, helping with the, the summer camp uh, this year, if that's you, I uh, would love to uh, would love to chat with you as well. Second way that we break the cycle of incarceration is through prison ministry, and we do that through chaplaincy services, um, Sunday morning chapel services, Friday night Bible studies, and um, and special events um, like Bible We take our, our volunteer, our, our youth volunteers, um, once or twice a year, we go into, into various prisons, um, with Easter programs and, and, uh, and Christmas programs as well. And if you're here and you're involved in prison ministry, I want to bless you and encourage you in that work. Uh, maybe it's been a while. You're kind of thinking maybe I should get out of it or what? No, stay stay in it. it you, your efforts make a difference. Research shows that any visit while someone's in prison, if, if somebody is in prison and they get a visit, um, and I would say it's, that could be as simple as a Bible study or a chapel services. It risk the risk of reconviction goes down 13 uh, percent, and that is is much more uh, goes down access to. And we're just just committed to provide those chaplains uh, for for men and women on the inside. Our staff needs um, looking for a prison ministry supervisor, somebody that would lead the chaplains, encourage and, 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 and lead the chaplains in the work that they do, as well as apprentice chaplains. We have an apprentice program that you go through. Um, it includes some D um, DOC or Department of Correction training, uh, but, but it's an extensive training time. And by the time you're done there, you're ready to sit down and, and do the ministry yourself. Men and women, we need um, uh, chaplains for both men and women prisons. And then there is uh, the mom care, um, and you saw Yvette's story, uh, and she shared about the importance of, of weekly visits, taking those children in, and, and for them to see their children, and for you to encourage and bless them um, in their in their journey. The doula services was something that we longed to do for many years, and it's just been the last couple of years that we were able to actually provide support during the pregnancy, and then also during the delivery, to have, to have staff that are there um, and supporting them emotionally and, and physically, just being there with them, uh, because they're not permitted to have any family with them as they have their as they have their child, uh, and then and then also to, to mentor and, and, and continue on support um, after they have their baby, and then the reentry program. What a blessing to walk with these moms as they as they get out. 
we don't have any staff needs um, in this, and it's, it's really sad, actually. Um, in in uh, August, there was a law passed in Colorado that judges could defer sentencing to pregnant women. And so what happens is they come in, and, and if they catch a prison sentence, they can wait to, um, to serve that sentence till after they have their baby, which sounds good until you know the lifestyle that they are living while that baby is in the womb. And, um, and our hearts just break for those children who are being exposed to um, not only a, a dangerous lifestyle, but also addictions and, and all of that. And we would just, we're praying that God would either reverse this, that sentence or that we could, uh, we could reach these moms and be able to walk alongside them um, and, and care for their children, provide visits, even after they go on the inside. So you can pray with us for that. A few um, administrators. Staff care, somebody that, that enjoys caring for people. The director of staff care positions has has two legs on them. One of that is is the HR division um, that somebody helps with, with kind of the, the onboarding, the, and then the spiritual life is the other side of that. We have some over 200 uh, people on on uh, payroll, and so it's a big job. And so if somebody has a calling for that, would love to chat with you as, as well as a spiritual life supervisor. One more, one more need, a uh, staff need with the admin is a video and photo manager. If you are here and you enjoy photography and videography and have that creative edge, uh, we'd love, for, love to talk with you as well. We'd love to do these videos that we do. We'd love to do those in-house. Uh, we'd be much better that way and also to be able to communicate with our donors and, and our constituents in a better way through that. So uh, there's another opportunity as well. Thrift stores are an important part of New Horizons. The thrift stores cover 100% of our overhead. Um, so when someone gives money to um, your organization, uh, donates, 100% um, of that goes to frontline ministry. It goes to child care, it goes to chaplain salaries, and, um, and it can go straight there because we, the thrift stores cover our administrative costs and also a lot of our, our capital expenses. A few staff needs there, furniture manager, uh, which, um, yeah, we need a furniture manager, assistant production manager. We have a production center where, uh, where that we produce for the for our stores, and then also looking for a store manager. Many of you are aware of the Ascend Youth Program. So excited what God is doing there. Always looking for more um, youth to come and and to serve, and also looking for a supervisor to oversee that program. Have a short video here of some of the the, the diasters, the volunteers sharing about the Ascend program. There is a lot of spiritual input. I enjoy getting to know new people, and yeah, that's definitely something that's happened since I've been out here as well. God was calling me to this season of surrender. You live right at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. It's beautiful out here. Before I joined the Youth Discipleship Program out here in the Ascend Program, I had gone to Bible school. I had been touched by what was going on there about ministry. I had been out here a couple times and visited and all the spiritual input that they appeared to pour into the youth. So as far as the thrift store work goes, I wasn't sure if I was going to enjoy it or not. I didn't necessarily care. All I wanted to do was just kind of get out of my comfort zone. And it definitely did do that. Throughout the week, you just go to work at a thrift store. On Tuesdays, we have the Ascend class. So the class is every Tuesday. You get a lot of spiritual input from them. The biggest one that has made an impact on my life is the understanding the Hebrew Bible. And it's been so interesting learning that, like understanding the Bible better and how it was written. So before coming out here, I was really just looking for a spiritual community and um, spiritual input. And I felt like, especially at this stage in my life, I needed just good discipleship. If you don't want to be stretched, don't come. But if you come and you're willing to be stretched and you're willing to grow, it'll be the best year of your life and you won't regret it. Living in the dorms is, it can be very stretching because you are just living with a bunch of other young people. Yeah, all the different personalities and everything. It can be very stretching, but it's so good. And you can just make such deep 
grounded relationships through that? I would say probably the biggest thing is just, it's drawing me so much closer to God. Help me understand who He is and who He is in my life. If you're here uh, tonight, you're, you would consider a youth person, you would consider coming. Uh, we do have a camp week uh, in June, and I think probably another one later on in the summer. We welcome you to come and, and just try it out, see if it's something that you would enjoy uh, being a part of. If you're here tonight, and there's something inside that stirred a bit, and you said, you know what, I would, I would like to be, <coughs> be, become more, more involved in the Horizons. I want to share some a few ways here. Um, if you haven't been stirred, that's fine. I'm, I'm good with that. But that God would stir your heart for the things that he's calling you to do right where you're at. Uh, you guys have amazing opportunities here as well. And I bless you uh, to step into, into that. A few ways that you can join us at New Horizons is um, joining, us in, joining us in prayer. If you want to get out your, uh, your little uh, packets that were passed out. A, uh, a, a place here to share. We have QR codes for all of this. You can just um, use that if you care to or go online. Um, if you'd like to be a part of the newsletter, um, stay updated on what, what is happening there. Feel free to um, to go to uh, sign up there. And then, and then our prayer team. Every week or two, we send out prayer requests for things that are happening, things that we're facing. And we'd love to have prayer warriors join us in prayer for So if that's you, that you would feel, um, you feel led to do that, then um, sign up there. Also, the, to be involved by joining our team. And on the next page, there's all the, uh, the positions uh, that are open. And also a QR that take, or website that takes you directly to a uh, website where you can fill out an application. I would say... If, if you're like me, uh, before I went to New Horizons, I would go to events like this, and I would sit in the audience, and I'd say, "Man, that's a great work." And if and if they if if I'm supposed to go, they'll ask me. I don't know if there's anybody here like that. Okay, if that's you, I'm asking you okay? <laughs> um, that you would consider. Or, you know, if, if something's stirring, like you don't quite know. Well, there's no. I can't really see where I would fit in. You still would love. You still would love. To talk with you, and then another way for you to get involved is um, is to give financially, and your finances again goes directly to front lines. It makes a difference in the lives of children. It it, it provides chaplains um, right in front of the uh, defender when they do that. It is really a, a support for these men and women uh, that are in prayer. Some of you uh, may choose to, to write a check tonight and say, you know what, this is this is for the ministry. Um, or there may be some of you that would consider um, becoming a monthly um, donor. Whatever amount a month would be great um, that as God lays it on your heart that you would follow through with that. This, this tour though is especially focused on raising funds for uh, chaplain salaries. And just to give a little bit of a, how important this is, um, a while back there was a guy that became, he became a Christian and um, as they were discipling him and, and then uh, brought him to baptism, asked him about his gang affiliation because he had been a part of the gang. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, that's in my past. He really didn't want to talk about it. But a, a, a while later, he came into the chapel very afraid. He said they just put the green light on him, which means that they were getting ready. They were going to kill him. Excuse me, because of his, because of him not supporting the gang. And um, so he came in to talk to the chaplain, like, what am I going to do? And, and uh, the chaplain, he has a, a sense of humor, uh, even in situations like that. He said, well, you remember the day that you became a Christian? And, uh, and, I'm so, and, and then the day that you became baptized? And he said, yeah, I remember that day. And he goes, well, you made a lot of commitments to me, didn't you? And um, the, the prisoner said, no, I didn't make them to you. I made them to God. And chaplain said, um, well, who do you think you made your uh, commitments to when you joined the gang? And he understood that he made those commitments um, to the enemy. And so they broke off those commitments um, in the name of Jesus, annulled them, um, and, and prayed through that. And as the gentleman was walking back to his cell, the head of the gang that had put the green light on him came up to him and said, um, hey, that thing I told you a while ago, just forget about it, it's all off. You don't, you don't have to worry, you're good. 
And I was reminded, whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever is loose on earth um, is loose in heaven. Another uh, gentleman came, this happened just recently, where um, he came into the chapel and, and he, he just, he said, I need to forgive my, I need to forgive my dad for what he did to me, but I'm gonna need some help. And he hadn't talked with his dad in eight years. And as they journeyed through that together again, praying through and finally coming to a place of forgiveness, um, that afternoon, his dad called the facility and wanted to talk with him. And when he got on the phone with him, he said, if you will forgive me for what I've done to you, I would love that relationship with you. I just love that part of having those chaplains right there um, ready to walk with these guys. So if you would, make, would choose to give tonight, that would go directly uh, to the, to the uh, chaplain's support. And if there's anything else um, that you would like to give to, you can you can note that on your card. Each of you have a um, envelope in the newsletter and in the other packet there. If you want to use the newsletter, and um, I mean use that envelope and give your contributions there, and then um, the, the ushers will be by a bit later to pick that up. Um, best um, if the wife, if you would come and just uh, make any comments you care to. Um, and then pray for the for the uh, offering. That would be great. I would invite your wife to come along, but she might tell stories about when I was in fourth grade. So we'll skip that this time. It's been a wonderful evening, and I thank God for His faithfulness. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our eternal, righteous, heavenly Father. It's truly with joy that we come before you to see you, the one that is worthy of all glory, praise, and honor. Lord, tonight we thank you that you have engraved each one of us in the palm of your hand. You love, you care for each one of us in this room tonight. And not just for us here in this room tonight, but for the world over, you care for each one. Lord, tonight, we thank you for your presence here tonight. We thank you that you have come and have been a part of us tonight. Lord, I thank you tonight for each one that has come out here, that is under the voice, hearing of my voice tonight. Lord, I just pray your blessing upon each one here to see you. We pray for the work at New Horizon, Lord, that you would continue to bless the work there. Bless each of all of here, each one that is working there. And Lord, tonight, you know each heart here tonight. Lord, you are calling. You know the call that you have upon each one here tonight. If it's to go to the work, Lord, just touch their hearts. Lord, in whatever way it may be, maybe it's just in prayer and taking time and lifting the others up to the throne of grace, Lord. We realize prayer is great as we approach your throne on the behalf of others. And then, dear Lord, it may be that of financial needs. And Lord, we realize that you have the psalmist of old said through the, as you said, I don't, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. But yet, dear Lord, it's your heart's desire. As you look at the hearts of each one of us here tonight, you are looking for willing hearts, willing hands to do what little we can. We realize it's small. But Lord, just pray tonight. May that which is given, Lord, maybe as the little boy that had those few loaves and those few small fishes, Lord, and how that it fed the multitude of 5,000. Lord, tonight, take what is given and may you multiply it over and over to the saving of souls and only eternity will truly spell out what has done, been done for you. So Lord, we just commit the evening to you, thanking you again for your wonderful love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Also, I was told to tell you ladies that the vases on the table, help yourself and uh, take them along home. Thank you. Thank you. That's the team to come on up. We have one more song we'd like to sing. Some of you may have been here a number of years ago when uh, our 
RJ was here, uh, shared about how God doesn't waste a thing. Um, he did write a book, and so if you are a reader and would love to see how God did miracles um, in his life, um, you can pick them up on the table for um, a donation of $13. You're welcome to those. And uh, well, he's, doing, he's doing great starting his own ministry um, to those who are incarcerated and, um, and people that are homeless. Um, it's, it's amazing what God is doing through him as well. Also, I would say that if, uh, for those of you who are a, who are uh, youth, if you want more information, uh, if you want more information about the youth, the Ascent program, there are brochures back there as well. And then the last thing, um, this is not a New Horizons program, but there are pipe brochures on the table. Um, I started this a long time ago because of my heart for uh, 12 to 12 and up year olds. And uh, it is basically a week in the rock in the Colorado Rockies, um, doing a backpacking trip, and um, young men leading, learning leadership. And um, so, if you have a son or you have somebody that would be interested in this, pick this up. There's a website you can go to and find out more about that program. We are going to um, end with. So again, thank you for coming. Thank you for your donation. So good to see familiar faces. Again, bless you all um, in your walk with the Lord. If you would stand with us. And if you know the song, please sing this song.